Okay, thank you. So we all look forward to this polyfold drinking game that will be <laughs> introduced in the afternoon. Um, okay, so so uh, so today I want to um, talk about how you would compute this knot contact homology um, in terms of flow trees, and then uh, describe some consequences of this calculation. So so um, so let me just recall. Uh, what we're doing. So, so we, have, we have a knot inside R3 uh, and then we take its conormal unit conormal lift which is the set of unit uh, so, so we take the, the points in, in uh, it sits, well maybe you remember so I'll say it in words it sits in the unit cotangent bundle of R3 so and that's you, the set of points that lie over the knot and, and, and which have co-vectors that are perpendicular to the tangent vector. And so this is a topologically a torus and it's a Legendrian, it's a Legendrian uh, torus. And we want to compute uh, what I call the Legendrian contact homology of, of this lambda k. So that's an algebra. Um, over the group ring, uh, of the second cohomology, so I'll, I'll tell you, well, maybe I'll write it up first like this. Uh, and then generated by rape chords. But let's perhaps <coughs> see what this uh, coefficient ring actually is. So uh, there are basically three variables in this uh, second cohomology. So, so, um, so one is the, so here is the longitude x, here is the meridian p in the torus. So we think of the torus as a boundary of a tubular neighborhood of the knot. And then there is also kind of a, so, so topologically this is just R3 times S2. So there is an S2 class <laughs> as well. So this is actually a three-dimensional um, space and so so the coefficient ring maybe I know where to write it I write it up here is actually equal to uh, the polynomial ring on three variables e to the x to the p and then I'll write the last one q you can write think of it as e to the to the t but but this so 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 q q is related to the s2 factor and x and p related to the to the longitude and meridian on the conormal of the of the of the torus. You haven't written plus minus one on the Q. Just yeah, I, I should. Thank you. Okay. So um, now uh, the theory that we are going to compute was just a, just again a reminder. So the if we compute the differential of a rave chord A uh, counts holomorphic curves in the symplectization of the following shape. So it has a positive puncture at A and then several negative punctures at B1, B2, B3. And <clears throat> basically the homology variables encodes the relative homology class of these disk capped off suitably. So I won't kind of talk so much about these caps. But if you close it off, then you get a disk with a boundary on this uh, lambda k inside here. So it has a second uh, homology class. Right. So, and, 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 and basically, so this is a holomorphic, holomorphic disk with punctures, one positive, several negatives. And so basically the first goal Today is to, to tell you how one could actually count in this setup uh, such disks. So <coughs> the first observation is that this, this unit cotangent bundle, in fact, is contactomorphic to the one jet space of S2. So uh, the map is just, if you take, say, x in the base here, y in the fiber, so y is the unit vector at x, then, then you map it just to y in the first, and then take the component of x, uh, which is perpendicular to y, and last you take this x dot y. So this is somehow 
this is now sort of Q, P, and Z. So this is contact homomorphism. So in fact, we can, we can compute this by calculating homology, uh, Lechonian contact homology in one jet space of a surface. And so let's, let's kind of study this a little bit. So the idea was to use flow trees. And let me now try to describe what they actually are. So if we're given, uh, so this, this just, uh, this is T star S2 times R. So if we're given lambda inside this J1 of S2, we can project it into the zero jet space of S2, which is called, this is called the front projection. And what is it? Well, <coughs> uh, so the, the front then, uh, the front of lambda uh, has so generically two types of singularities. Uh, cusp edge, uh, they have so of course smooth points where it looks like a graph of a function. And uh, this is S2 times R, I should say. Uh, and then it has the following singularities only. So there are these cusp edges where it looks like that. So here, here is somehow is the zero section, and here's the R direction. So it's a, well, okay. So cusp edge. And uh, the other singularity is the swallowtail. Somehow looking like that. So it's a Cut <clears throat> two cusp edges coming together and the, the, the kernel sort of converging to this cusp direction and swallow things. So in other words, if, if you have a, uh, a Legendre and then you can draw it in three-dimensional world, so kind of in S2 times R, you would draw some multigraph uh, and, and that determines for you the Legendre. So again, Remember that, that <coughs> locally, maybe I'll go on here. So locally here is the zero section and here somehow is your, your pi of f. Then, no pi of f, pi of lambda. So then, then uh, this gives you, so locally you have z of say, you know, q1, q2. And then uh, you can solve for, for the p-coordinates in terms of of, of the function and the Q coordinates by taking derivatives. Right? So, so the front determines for you the, the Legendre. Okay, so, um, but in particular, if you're at this, in general, of course, you may have more than one such, such sheet, and they even may be singular, but let's forget about the the singularity for a bit, so we stay outside the singular locus. Then, over this point, you, you have locally a number, here three, of functions, graphs of functions, right? So, so your Legendrian for you locally defines some finite number of functions, unless you're kind of at kind of the point of the cusp edge, where it's a little bit difficult to say what this function is. But for, for generic points in the basis of open dense outside co-dimension one subset, you have these functions. And so now I want to tell you what is a flow tree. And the flow tree, uh, and the flow trees, first I should say why I'm, I'm going to tell you what the flow tree is. So flow trees. Outside co-dimension one or outside co-dimension two? No, outside co-dimension one in the base. So outside, you know, outside the image of this cusp edge, right? The cusp edge is one dimensional, right? So, uh, okay. yeah. So, so when, once you're outside there, you really have uh, sheets. And when you're at the cusp edge, you have a couple of sheets and then this bent thing. Below a crossing is just totally okay. That's fine. That doesn't matter if they cross. It's a, just, I, I need these functions. Okay. So, so, so I am going to explain to you what are the, these Morse flow trees that we need to count. And they, they will exactly, they, first of all, they're rather finite dimensions, so combinatorial, you can actually find them, which is good, but then they, it will turn out that they correspond exactly to holomorphic curves, so it gives you a calculation of this differential in terms of Morse theory data, basically. Okay. So, um, so a flow tree is 
is a map, uh, let's say u, from a tree, let's call it gamma, so this kind of abstract tree, into, in this case, S2, so into the base. And uh, if I draw it, so, uh, okay. And we require that along each edge, the, the flow tree, Im the, the image of the tree agrees with, so we fix, fix also a Riemannian metric on this uh, S2, so we can talk about gradients. So, so it follows the gradient, maybe with, this is of course stupid to write something like that. It follows the gradient of, of, of uh, these local function differences. And, <coughs> and, and so, so, so you, you sort of have pieces of gradient segments. And then at the vertices, you have certain matching conditions. So you, you always have like a cyclic order or order of, of these things. And, and you can, you see, if you look at this thing, you can actually lift it naturally to, to, the, uh, to the Lagrangian. So here is this minus gradient F i minus Fj. But above that, there are these uh, sheets, right? So this somehow is Fi and Fj. And of course, you can just take this line and lift it twice. So you can lift it to somehow to its, uh, uh, to, its uh, <coughs> to the sheet where it belongs, right? So this kind of, you just lift it straight up. And there is a kind of orientation rule, which I'm not going to bother you with. But it, it's supposed to look like holomorphic curve. So, so on, the, on the one of them, I think you always uh, orient by minus this gradient. Where Sorry, we, I'm, I'm also, uh, <laughs> can, can you put some more axes on that picture? What, what's ah, yeah, uh, I could. So, so here, so this, this thing here lives in, uh, in the base. So this sits in S2. And, uh, and over S2, I, I, so, so somehow I have to draw many more axes. So th this, this is a big axis containing the fiber, uh, I don't know, the fibers of, of T star S2 and R, actually. I, I can think of it as I lift all the way to the Lachandrian, right? So the Lachandrian lies, so this is a sheet of the Lachandrian. This is another sheet. So it's somehow just here projects down and I, I sort of lift them up and as long as I'm outside the singularity locus I'm I'm fine. So and I haven't sort of to told you about this. Yeah, uh, <coughs> I'm not quite there yet. So so le le but le let me draw let me draw in one dimensional example. It would be kind of uh, maybe illustrate something. Right, so uh, So, so just, just uh, in, in dimension one, this is easy to make precise. So he, here we have some kind of x-axis. And then uh, here is c-axis. So we have this, this c minus y dx. And so, so I would have maybe one line like that and one line like this. So this, this is the front. This is my lambda. And if I go over to this x-y plane, uh, then... Uh, Maybe it's better to do that. Um, so then, uh, and, and I have y is equal to dc dx. So, so this zero sheet, one sheet. So zero sheet lying here, and one sheet is lying above. And my flow line is just kind of following. Of course, this is a stupid thing. It's just in one dimension, but it's lying in the base. But over this thing in the base, I could lift it. Uh, to either this this uh, sheet or that sheet, right? That's because they, they're just uh, just above here. Now, if, if there are more dimensions, there's kind of no no big deal. It's just a local diffeomorphism, so I can do it. Okay. Um, right. And I now require that when I come to these these uh, uh, vertices, I want the lift to match, right? So so somehow, if I look, so now I'm drawing one of these sheets in, into which I lift. So I, I have this incoming thing uh, from, let's say, fi here. Then I should continue in the same sheet, and I should be able to, to, to patch them here. So that the total lift is a continuous curve. So, so ba basically, it would look like boundary holomorphic disk. That's what, what, we, what we want. Um, so, but instead of, instead of uh, 
So, so basically, so, so at this, this junction, there is one thing looking like that, and there is one another sheet where it looks something like that, and, and a third sheet where it also looks like this. So there are three local pictures, right? This is somehow, I'm trying to, so this is the picture of some holomorphic, this is one dimensional picture, where I, where I in, in one, so there is no, in dimension one it's going too straight, but in dimension two it's making a little bend here, this one is this one, and then last I have this one. So they, there are these one, two, three sheets where the three boundary components live of this holomorphic disk, and so that's what it's supposed to look like. Okay, but now for our calculation, this is some, some sort of theorem uh, that I proved many years ago. So, I, so somehow the first people to explore this tree thing was, uh, I think, Fukaya O wrote a paper about this, uh, where you have... A, here would correspond to having Lagrangian without any singularities at all. So now, what, what I did was I extended to, to the case when there are singularities, and maybe not uh, by now, I guess. So in, in the paper, there was some kind of restriction on singularities, but certainly it was fine to do this in demand for, for two dimensions where there are only these two singularities. So, so let me tell you what are the counterparts of this rigid disk that we count. So a rigid... Uh, so to the vertices of the trees are they meant to stay away from the projection of the singularities? Yeah, yeah, so, I should, so the yeah. vertices of the trees lie in uh, sort of the good part where you have these. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you kind of exactly where, where, where vertices everything now. So, 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 so indeed, the, the, the actually, the vertices need not stay away from the bad part. So they can be there, but somehow the, the tree always begins and ends either at this uh, cusp edge or at critical points. So, but but I'll, I'll tell you. So, so a rigid tree. Uh, has only the following vertices. So, so they can have valency 1. Uh, and there it could be a, 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 a rape chord in some sense. So, so somehow, if I, I don't know how to draw, but I'll draw like this. So, so here, here you see, this is a front picture. Here you see a kind of a, a, critical, a critical point. So the, the, this, this would be a rape chord where you have a critical point. And a, a, a flow line can certainly start there, just like in Morse theory. So this is sort of a Morse, Morse, uh, Morse vertex, Morse critical point. Or maybe I should say critical. And it can be of two flavors just like before. So I, when, when you orient this flow tree, you see I, either you go up, up the rape chord or down the rape chord. Up the rape chord is positive puncture, down the rape chord is negative puncture, just like for the holomorphic curves. And we look at flow trees with only one positive puncture. So they have critical vertices. And then there is another type of vertex where the tree just goes right into the, to the to the cusp edge, so that's an end. So you see, of course you could have a, like a flow line coming this way, and then the, it's, it's a positive function difference just shrinking to zero at this. So, so it, 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 it can go there, right? So I should draw one more picture here to make you. So these pictures live in S2, or do they live yeah. in the front? This lives in S2, and this is a somehow a picture of the front over where this S2 picture is. And if I draw the picture in this, this other XY thing, then this is just some kind of holomorphic disk like this. And this uh, is a holomorphic disk like that. Sorry, that, that vertex is still one valent. This is one valent, yeah. And then I have some two valent vertices. So again, I have two valent critical point. So, so that's just in some sense a little bit special case of this, but that's when I want to have, for example, a positive puncture at a minimum. So then I would try to, do, to flow out of this minimum, but I cannot. There's no, it's just constant flow, right? It doesn't flow out. But if I have some other sheet in between here, then 
what I can do is I can take this thing and I can split it and then the things flow in different directions. So that looks like that. So it's a sort of degenerate version of, of some combination of vertices, but, but it needs to be included. It happens only if this guy is a max, it's a max or a minimum. Can, can you label the lines and the sheets on these pictures? <laughs> yeah, here? Uh. Each thing to a flow tree should have two numbers attached. Maybe the two. Uh, yeah. So right. So so here. So I, I'm going to know. So here it's, it's a. It goes between flow line two and one, and here it goes between flow line two. Uh, no, sorry, one and zero. This guy is between one. And one and zero. And this one, and maybe it's then between. I mean, I okay. One and two, right? So this is this this flow line, and this is this flow line. So, but what's happening to this thing? You've got a red cord, like uh -huh. which is going, at this, which is an yeah. isolated thing in between one and zero, and then you're flowing. So when you flow, what do you flow? I flow with these. Uh, it, 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 it's yeah. a holomorphic disk. You're yeah, it is. So so in in this picture, it sort of looks like something like this that that you you just pass by this in the very flat thing. You just pass by this. Uh, so, so you see. It, the flow line that just goes, so if I draw it, so in the limit it will be extremely flat. So the flow line that just goes passing by, that, that would be this one that just continues, but it can decide to swap sheets here, right? So that's kind of how, how one should view it here. But what is this limit you're taking? I haven't taken the limit yet, but, I, but what I'm doing is I'm scaling the fibers down. So, in the, in the, so I have a Lachandrian sitting somewhere, and I just scale the fiber so that it's coming closer and closer and closer to zero section. And for sufficiently small, when it's sufficiently close, there will be one, one, one correspondence between trees and disks. So that's, um, I mean, in dimension one, there's maybe this always, but in higher dimensions, it's not. Uh, okay, so, so there, there, this, this is the easy two valent, and then there is the, the difficult two valent, which is called the switch. Uh, so the switch is a flow line. So here, here's the cusp edge. I'll call it sigma. It's a flow line between, and I should again label. So I label this this sheet with a. So this is in the bottom, but maybe I'll draw it here. So this is some some other sheet somewhere. It's very difficult to draw. So so here I have a a flow line that that going between. The, this third sheet, no, this, this top sheet and, and the lower one, and it starts out creeping up along the lower one, and then it can go up until it's on the upper one. So it can so sneak by the cusp edge. So, so it, it's a flow line that is tangent to the cusp edge here, and then it starts out, so here it's on the, on the lower one, and, and it's moving up to the upper one. So, so, so this is unfortunately invisible in dimension one. So this is the the only true high dimensional input, maybe. Okay. Uh, and finally, there are uh, three, three valent vertices. What is going on in the base in that picture? In the base, you see, um, so, so in the base, I should draw the base maybe more properly. So here's the base, this is S2. And there is somewhere, is the image of this cusp edge, right? So this is sigma, so here, for this sheet, so maybe the multiplicity is zero here and two here, right? So you, you, you cross this cusp thing. And then, and then you have the flow line, which actually is somehow defined only up to this point because then it stops. But, but if you continue it, the flow line is tangent to, 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 the, to the fold. And at this tangency, it switches from one to the other. Okay? And so, yeah. So somehow if you think you have a family of flow lines, then this is picking a specific one that gets stuck onto the sigma. Right. Um, and then the trivalent things. So they're a little bit easier. First there is a, something I call y0, where, where they're just, so that, that was the one that I drew up there. So just three smooth sheets, and then the, the flow comes in between two and decides to split into two. It can happen anywhere somehow. Can you label that? Yeah, so, 
So I think we could do something like this. So, so basically, when you lift it, it, it will look like this. So this is on sheet zero, this is on sheet two, and this is on sheet one. So it, it's like that. And there is a similar one which, which I call Y1, which involves also the cusp edge, and that somehow the picture is the same, but, but here is the sigma, and it splits and right, right over the cusp edge. So this is Y1 tree. And, and the picture indeed is uh, the following in terms of fronts, that they have a flow line that comes in and then decides to split into two flow lines between the, between the two newborn sheets. So it splits and there's sort of two ways to go there. This Y1 vertex. Okay. And then, uh, <clears throat> and, and now as you see, so, so now our trees, they are in some sense, uh, so they, they kind of complete, right? So they start at critical point and they close up at either critical points or at these ends, right? So, so it's, it's, it will be a, a curve exactly as a boundary of holomorphic curves that goes from endpoints of, of chords to uh, endpoints of chords, right? It's somehow exactly looking like boundary holomorphic curve. And, uh, and the main theorem and reason for saying this uh, so why don't we have n valence no so uh, because I look at rigid trees so so you can certainly imagine you know something like this happening but that would be in one parameter family so 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 but but when I look at for generic data which is somehow all I care about, they, they will have only trivalent, maximally trivalent vertices. And, and if you would look at five parameter families, then you would have to look at some deeper tangencies, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's a, so this is the calculation for, for, for uh, rigid trees. Um, if you have two flow lines coming in and meeting each other, mm -hmm. do you demand that they interact in a three-valent vertex, or can they just cross? They could cross, they could cross, that's fine. They, that, that's also, a, it's, a, it's a map, right, locally looking like, so they, they can cross, yeah, it's certainly, yeah. It's, it, it, it need not be embedded, this, this boundary. I'm a little puzzled by this picture here, because zero <coughs> and two look completely symmetric to me. The, 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 the way you're translating it into a disk is not symmetric, because one is playing a different role, right? Yeah. Your, your disk has got boundaries on zero and two. Yeah, and one, and one. And yeah. it also has a boundary on one, yeah. right? This is three. So they, they're playing different roles, that's right. But, but, uh, but I, I, have, I have here always like kind of cyclic ordering. Cyclic ordering. So, so I know which one comes after. And I, I need to, and you know, know match, match that. The ordering of the, because you've got an R action. So you've got your sheets are somehow <coughs> ordered from bottom to top. So Yeah, you, you could say that. But that, that's not so essential. I just have a local numbering. Right. And, and when I lift this, it ends up in some sheet, right? right. And, and, and actually. I have this orientation convention, so one, one of the lifts is oriented towards the puncture and the other one is oriented away from it, right? Uh -huh. So when I come and I go towards the puncture, I know which sheet I should continue on and I require that it's oriented so that, that it matches there, right? I see, so you're, you're, you're orienting sort of coming in on yeah. the zero two spoke and then going right. out on the other two. Out on the other, so, so that it ma makes an oriented curve, that's right? That's why it's that, not completely That's right, that's why I can yeah. lift it and it's not so Yeah. That's right, that's right. Yes, yeah, so, so this is a, some kind of theory, and it's, it's a, a lot of work to prove that they actually correspond to holomorphic curves. But, yes? Uh, so the, the worst function I'm supposed to think of is the Hamiltonian that I was looking at when I was degenerating my curves, right? No. No, the Morse function, the, the functions that you're supposed to think about are, are the functions locally defined by the Legendrian itself. So the Legendrian gives you locally some number of functions. And the gradient lines are of the differences of those functions. So, uh, so, so somehow, uh, in order to understand this uh, theory, one needs only to do one exercise, actually. So, the, so, so this exercise is the following. It's at the end of my paper on flow trees. So, so, so you take R2. So this is the, the zero section. 
And then you take some other sheet, which is sloped, say, this way, and then you would get flow lines going from left to right, say. And then you leave the up, up, upper sheet, but on the lower sheet, you somehow you isotope it a little bit so that you introduce a, a ring of singularity. So, and, and actually, this is, maybe I should draw, yeah, I'll try to draw it. So the slice here is this. So this is sort of the first Radomaisen move in uh, Lachandre North here. So, so you take this ring, and now you just uh, check what happens with this family. So you would find the kind of all these all these singularities playing a role, and and maybe for these um, polyfold-minded people, it's a kind of interesting exercise because um, it shows that these trees. So here, where rigid trees are rigid, so they kind of they're sitting there, but 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 here you will find trees somehow looking some way uh, that have the property that they 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 live in a one-parameter family, but this piece of the tree completely fixed, but that piece is moving. So it's a somehow these flow trees are in some sense desperately non-elliptic. So this is, uh, I think. Oh, could you explain what's more of this? Um, no, I, I, this will take up all my time. So I will, I will leave to discussion this kind of experiment. <laughs> but just, just kind of for reminder of elliptic theory, so somehow a flow tree living in, say, one or higher dimensional family, it can be completely fixed some places and other places move. So this is somehow anti elliptic behavior, right? So, so I think this, this, this squeezing thing that I have not yet stated my theorem, I should, but, but it's uh, doing something rather non-trivial. It's killing some. It's adiabatic limit, so maybe it's not surprising, but uh, okay. So. <coughs> so the main theorem in this business then is that uh, uh, so the, the, the Lachandrian DGA differential uh, can be, so the, this the theorem is actually stronger, but let me just state it like this now. So it can be computed by counting uh, flow trees instead of disks. So, so we need actually one more, one small extension of this, well, maybe not so small, but one extension of this theory, um, which is the following. So... Do you just never have to speak about the swallowtails? Okay. Did you never have to mention the swallowtail? No, that's right. So, and the reason, I mean, of course, when you try to calculate, they will play some role, but, but the reason is basically this, that the trees that we're looking at, the disk we're looking at, they're rigid. And they have one dimensional boundary, and this guy has co-dimension two, so they should never pass this point, and indeed they don't. So, so they, but, but of course when you try to calculate, they would play some role. So this is some kind of extension of this, which we will use. So, so now imagine uh, that you have your sum Lachandrian inside this J1 of S2. So this will be actually the conormal lift of the unknot in our case. And assume that you have, so this Lachandrian looking here, lying here, and then you have some other Lachandrian, which lying lambda, which lies in a small neighborhood of this lambda zero, right? So lambda zero has a neighborhood which looks like the one jet space of lambda zero. This is a kind of tubular neighborhood in this business. So, so we take lambda inside the one jet space of lambda zero inside one jet space of S2. And now, we're interested in counting disks on lambda, on lambda. And then uh, what we do again, we take lambda and, and we, we do this pinching thing, which allows me to kind of relate disks and, and trees. And now, the, the, so I'm, I'm stating this kind of very sloppily, but the theorem is that what you should look for is you should look at disks on lambda, zero, with flow trees growing out on the boundary. So, so basically you can have a big disk, so, so, so let me draw. So you can have a sort of a big disk and somewhere in this narrow region 
grows out these narrow pieces of the holomorphic disk. Like that. So, so basically, if you pretend that you know everything for some reason about holomorphic disks and lambda zero, and you know the flow trees between lambda and lambda zero, then you know all the holomorphic disks you need for lambda as well. So, uh, and, and the, the theorem says that in order to count the disks on lambda, C, lambda, then you can count instead the, what I call naturally quantum, quantum flow trees. They, they appear in many other guises called cascades and whatnot. So it's okay. Um, right. So now let us actually, let us actually try to apply this machinery to calculate the knot contact homology of the unknot. So, so, so the plan, I should say, what the plan is, the plan is actually to calculate the knot contact homology for the unknot, and then it will actually be quite easy to calculate for any knot. So what's the, what's the strategy? So strategy is as follows. Yes? So in the theorem, is something that's allowed to have two disks on lambda knots connected by a flow tree? No, no. So we, because we have just one positive puncture. So such a guy would have to have two positive punctures in this case. But in general, if you count everything, then, I mean, if you look at all orbitary holomorphic curves, such things would happen. But here it won't. So, so it's much easier. In some sense, the action can only flow down. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, right. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the plan for calculation is as follows. So, so, you know, we take the unknot, and that defines, uh, that gives us this co-normal of the unknot, which is a torus. And now if you take any other knot, you can braid it around the unknot. So this is kind of k. And that, that gives you this lambda k. But then, in fact, if you think about it, this lambda k sits now inside some one jet small neighborhood of lambda u. So in order to calculate the thing, we'd need to understand all the holomorphic disks on lambda u, and then all the trees between lambda k and lambda u. And this is actually kind of one can do. And let's start with lambda u. So first we need to draw the thing. Uh, so, 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 and we take this. Uh -huh. We take the u to be just a, exactly like round circle in the, in the x1, x2 plane. And so we are trying to draw its front. So remember what, what was somehow this, here is a zero, strangely. Uh, but, <laughs> but anyway, so, so <laughs> what was this last, uh, the last uh, coordinate? So that was somehow c over in, in one jet space of S2 or zero jet space of S2, that was uh, z was equal to uh, position dot uh, co-vector. So somehow now we have in the co-normal, we need to understand what's happening to this, this little circle of co-vectors and then somehow we would be done. So I'm gonna draw it for you, it's very easy. So here is the S2, this is the zero section and I, I will draw the R axis to be just like, uh, you know, starting at the origin, going to infinity. So the lift of this circle, so here, when I'm here, the y dot, the position vector is positive. So I would, and, and uh, over at the poles, it is zero. So I would get some kind of circle like this, right? So, so somehow, I, 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 it's the circle that I see, and here the function is positive, and here it is negative. So that's it. But now we have symmetry, so we can just swing it around. So the actual lift, the front of the co-normal lift, is this strange torus, mapped with two singularities, which looks like cone, cones over the poles. And where are the rabe cores? Well, the rabe cores, so this is not, uh, unfortunately a little bit gen non-generic, so I will perturb it in a second. But the, the cores first, they actually, they come in a, in an S1 family, right, over the equator. There's a whole S1 family of chords, which corresponds to actually binormal geodesics in here. So, so one should have said, but I didn't. So, so anyway, you have these chords. And, 
And if you perturb it a little bit, so you can make it short on one side, you get the chord C, and long on the other side. And then remember this grading formula we had, and the grading formula says that the grading of C is 1, and the grading of E is 2. So in order to calculate the differential, we only have to care about what happens to C. And, uh, and you see, that it's pretty clear what happens, right? We have two flow lines going out from C. One goes up, up towards the pole, and one goes down towards the pole. Now, unfortunately, pole is a little bit degenerate, so we need to perturb it and then to see what's really going on in terms of flow trees. Two flow lines of what? Two flow, so uh, maybe I should use color short. So, the, so the, the, yellow, the yellow thing here is the zero section, okay? The white thing are graphs of, that's the front, so they define a function, graphs of function. So here, if I'm standing at this point, I have exactly one function difference, the difference between this sheet and that sheet. And if I follow the gradient flow that decreases kind of function, then I just flow straight up to the pole. So there are sort of the, the flow lines that we see, there are two such flow lines, one going up, one going down. Here it's a little bit unknown what happens because it's too non-generic, but I will perturb it so that it becomes generic. Right. This is also a nice exercise, what happens with this Lagrangian cone when you perturb it. Uh, one can say many things, but it somehow is in, in the middle, it's the middle stage of a circular version. But, but anyway, so if, if I draw this, so here is the cone, and if I draw it from the top, it somehow looks like this, right? So you have two, <coughs> two sheets, and there is a somehow a dot in the middle. Now I'm going to try to draw, draw for you what it looks like when I, when I resolve it, and I will draw the projection because it's simpler. So there will be four cusps, and two double lines, and outside here, it of course looks exactly the same. So this may be kind of um, slightly difficult to see the first time you, you think about it, but let me draw the movie, maybe. Yes? Can I get this picture by perturbing this? Ab absolutely, yeah, so if you perturb this. Oh, no, 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 perturbing this. The unknot, yes, yes, you can. So you'd have to uh, roll it up a little bit along a cylinder instead of having it in the plane. So you would find four inflection points, which are these, these guys here. But, but this you cannot get by perturbing this guy, actually. You cannot never get two rape cores, two binormal cores. You would always have, because they count with orientation. So you, you'd always have four if you do it. So you're sort of thinking in this picture that you have a top circle which, yeah. which uh, abuts on the, uh, which goes to the two top faces of that tetrahedron, and you have a back, a, a bottom disc which abuts on the back two faces yes. of that tetrahedron, yes. and then you attach them along the tetrahedron. You sort of think of removing the interior of that tetrahedron. Yes, and two of them will be two smoothed like this, and the other one smoothed. That's right. Yeah, you can imagine. Right. That's right. Yeah. So maybe I don't have to draw the movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm not drawing the movie. So. Uh, so. So. Anyway, what is the? If, if you look, so this is in the front, and the, the Lagrangian lift of this is, is just a cylinder, like this, and somehow the middle circle is completely killed in the projection. So. Okay. And now we need to figure out what's going on with these flow trees. So we go up here, and in fact. One of them looks like this. I should draw it with some other color. One of them looks like this. And the other one looks exactly the same in the beginning, but I won't draw it exactly the same. And then it splits over here. And in this picture, it corresponds to the disk coming from here and coming from here. And it can go either this way or that way. So there's somehow these, these two options. So one. The, the eye-shaped disk is maybe is this one. What is that cylinder? Yeah. This cylinder is the pre-image of this in the Lachandrian itself, right? So in the Lachandrian, this is, this is almost uh, isomorphism, except it crushes the middle circle. And when I draw the boundary of this, this, the lifts of these trees, it basically looks like this. One goes 
down one way and the other one goes down the back. So there are these two curves and when you lift them are non-homotopic, right? They kind of differ by this. So in fact, we have four disks and we find that this DC is equal to um, uh, one, and there are some signs here which I won't discuss right now, minus e to the x, minus e to the p plus q e to the x, e to the p. So uh, I'm, I'm also not, because I'm sort of running out of time, so I'm not going to tell you about the q right now. It's somehow basically, no, I, I am going to tell you about the q. So basically you have to count intersection numbers of these disks which are just the lying ab above the flow lines with some fiber. And then if you take this fiber, I think, to lie here, then you get exactly this calculation if it's up on the North Pole. This is a choice, again, of capping path and so on. But you see that the, there are four disks, and they live in, in four different homotopy classes. So first you were telling us there's two disks, and now you're telling us there's four disks. <laughs> now I'm telling you there are two flow lines that we see starting from here, right? But then what, what's going to happen up here, that's not clear from this picture. Then we have to see how would they continue. So I, I have two, I have exactly two flow lines going, go, one flow line going up, up to this point. But then there are different histories, one going straight and one going. And again, uh, kind of even here illustrating this not so super elliptic, and also super elliptic. Not really, I mean, the, the two maps actually agree here, right? So that's uh, not so elliptic to then not agree. Okay. So, uh, so this is our, our calculation, and uh, uh, and I'm somehow desperately much behind time, behind schedule. So let me try to to do something with this calculation. So now, uh, the one key thing that will appear in the talk tomorrow is what's called the augmentation. I, I should also say what is this D of E. The D of E is easy, it's actually easy to see that this D of E is just a Morse differential, so it's C minus C, so that's zero. So, <clears throat> so I want to talk about the augmentation. Augmentation uh, variety, which is probably the most important uh, Invariant derived from this contact homology. So, so we have this. We have our algebra, this A of lambda k, and um, we can look at the locus where you have a chain map into integers. So maybe I will switch at some point to some other coefficients, but it doesn't matter. Uh, yes, I'm sorry to ask this. But yes. You've got two e's in that picture. You've got you've got the e, which is the generator, and then you've got e <laughs> <and that's laughs> separate. Yeah. And dc, c is one-dimensional, yeah, and d, does that go Two. down in dimension? Yeah, the, the differential decreases grading by one. So you in, that should be multiplied by e, then? That's, a, no, that's just no. a coefficient you've got. No, no, I mean, e is stupid. Let, let me change to something else. f, no, maybe f is well, a function. A. A. a? What about a? But then dc, if it goes, that dc is one-dimensional, so this should be a multiplying by that generator, then? No, a. A has degree two, right? right. And, and, and C appears in its boundary, so that's degree one. So the differential decreases degree by one. Oh, it and the and the constant the constants all are degree zero. It yeah. just, that just goes, into goes into the ring, which is degree okay. zero. So, okay. yeah, so, thanks. Um, right. Wait. So the augmentation variety uh, is the is the locus. Uh, so I should say is the locus of the of in, in the in the space kind of e to the x e to the p and q, where uh, there is a chain map uh, like that. Um, right. So so let let's take a look at this our one and only example. What, what is this locus? So uh, uh, a uh, chain map where this has the trivial differential. And it lies in degree zero. OK. 
So, so here for the unknot, this is somehow extremely simple. Because the only thing that it requires, and this, the only thing that it requires is that uh, uh, the image of the differential degree one is killed by this map, right? So because uh, so this 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 we, we try to try to define maybe epsilon, and the image in the differential has to be killed. So so we see the equation. So the equation for the augmentation variety. Uh, is equal to uh, 1 minus e to the x minus e to the p plus q e to the x e to the p. OK, and now uh, in the last few minutes, let me somehow just very fast explain what happens with a general note. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to follow this. Oh, maybe I'll keep the augmentation right. Follow this strategy. Uh, and tell you sort of how it goes. Um, and you mean the variety is where that vanishes? The variety is right. That's right. Uh, that's right. So the, the variety is the zero set of this thing, which is is the augmentation polynomial. Thank you. Right. So um, yeah. I, This can stay. Yeah. So, so if you have a, uh, a general knot, then as indicated on the top board, we will braid it along the unknot. And in fact, uh, so. So here I'm drawing strangely the unknot as a straight line. And then the braid will consist of some strands here. But in fact, what you can do is you can have these strands all kind of increase along the knot, except you have to close them up when you're here, right? So, 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 so somehow, because you know, what is a braid? Braid kind of turning, but you can certainly keep on going outwards and turn and just kind of have the outwards motion dominate, right? So that means that there will be no binormal chords at all here. Rather, all of them will be here, etc. So, so, so if you have a brand on n strands, uh, then you have chords sort of aij here and bij here. <coughs> and they, they go both ways, right? So you have something like, 2n squared from here, right? And all the twisting takes place in the, pl in the point where they're going up. So, so they're yeah. Two, uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, it's a completely straight here. So the twisting does not really interact with the chords at all. That's right. right. Then if you look at it from the top, you see, now I should draw this thing extremely close to the original one. So you see that there will also be these, these chords that correspond to the chords on the unknot, right? So, so you will have some kind of chords C, I, J, and let's call the other ones not E, because I call them A. No, not A, you see? <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> OK, so I'll call them A, I, J, anyway, okay. with the twiddle. So, OK, so, 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 so there are remnants of the long chords on the unknot uh, that, that, that goes between different sheets. OK. And now, um, what we need to do, we need to understand what are the flow trees on the on this torus and in fact uh, so this lambda k inside j1 of lambda 0 is given by by the function so let, let me sort of introduce some more coordinates so here I have my circle I have a coordinate s along the circle and then I have some uh, then I have some uh, coordinate xi, say, along the, along the, uh, ve 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 in, in the, in the, this is a d2. So in the neighborhood is s1 times d2. And this one is given by the, so, and, and if I have a, 
my kind of braid here. So that, that defines for you a vector f j of s, the j strand, in this disk, right? So, so somehow, as a function of s, the point is moving in the disk as I go around. And the function of this guy is just fj of s dot xi. So this somehow is the, the function that generates this, this front. Oops. And it makes it not so hard to, to find the flow lines, etc. So let me just tell you very briefly what happens. So, so here I'm now drawing. This is the front of the this is the front of the unknot lambda zero. It needs a torus, and I'm drawing it like kind of like a square. Um, and the yellow lines are what's going to the poles. So this somehow is the preimage of the, the cone point. And then uh, when I my, if my strands so my 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 AIJs and BIJs, they will be here. Uh, AIJ, GIJ. And this is actually AJI, JI and BJI. It doesn't matter so much how I encode this. So if my, my strands just go completely straight, then the relevant stable and unstable manifolds here just go completely straight like this, all of them. So this is the only, the only stable unstable manifolds, whatever they are, where the function differences stay positive. So if, if I, there are also flow lines kind of falling down here, but then very rapidly the function difference become negative and I cannot find any trees. So my trees have to kind of follow these things. So for the unlink, the calculation is simple. Now, what happens when I introduce a twist? When I introduce a twist, I change the flow line like this. So it's going instead like that, and this one is falling down here and coming back up, right? So, so now, in order to count the trees, you just need to keep track of how many times did it intersect something here. And so it's not kind of terribly difficult to do. It some, takes some combinatorial skills to be able to organize this. But then basically, uh, you can find all the trees by composing these things. So, so sort of one tree, we look like that, and then you feed this to the next thing, and there will maybe be another tree like this. So, and then you eventually you co collect them up here. So this is one piece of the, uh, I'm, I'm going to say something for two more minutes. This is one piece of the calculation. But note that in this picture, if I draw this kind of carefully, I can also draw the images of all these other big holomorphic disks. So they look something like this. So I need to make sense out of these big disks with flow trees kind of attached on them. And, and this can also be read off from this picture. So basically, this picture tells you everything and gives you a similar uh, expression. So let, let me just very schematically finish by saying what, how you deal with the augmentation polynomial. So, so what, what you get is some sort of, and I, I will, uh, yeah. So, so, so you will have uh, in degree in degree one you have Cijs and Bijs, and in degree zero you will have Aijs. Okay, and basically, so you, you find something like this: that d of Cij and, and constants. How about a tilde Ij? No, they are these short AIJs, these, these guys. Where is the A tilde IJ? Uh, the A tilde IJ has degree 2. So they, they, they w w would have been EIJ, but no, they're A tilde. <laughs> but they, they degree 2, so I don't have to care so much. So, so, so this DC IJ and equal to this BIJ, that's in, if you think about this, this is just some kind of polynomial. I don't know. PCIJ in the AIJs, right? And this is some other polynomial PBIJ in the AIJs. So, uh, and now what we want to do, we would 
were sort of obsessing about this augmentation variety or polynomial and how to find it. Well, we need to find values where all these polynomials have common roots. Right? So basically, you can find this augmentation polynomial by elimination theory. Right? So, so, so you, you have to take your note, you sort of write it down like this, draw this picture, and find there is actually there's a formula from a braid presentation. You take this thing, and then you, 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 you do elimination theory, you get the polynomial. And this polynomial is called augmentation polynomial. And in this case, the elimination theory is extra simple, right? Because there's kind of nothing to eliminate. But, but, but in general, it's more complicated. So uh, maybe let me f finish by, by stating what I wanted to say, and then and maybe one exercise. So the ideal exercise here is maybe the simplest exercise. Is say calculate for Hopflink, right? And somehow the Q is the Q is somehow related to having something on this from this disk. So if you calculate or trefoil if you wish, that's a little bit more difficult. So calculate for Hopflink and find this augmentation polynomial or augmentation variety. Here it's more complicated. Okay, um, so. What I intended to, to say and actually also to prove was the following, that uh, the, uh, the theorem <coughs> is due to Lenny Ng, and there's also some other, myself and Silibak and Larchev. This, this is the original proof, and then the other proof is some other, by string topology somehow. But that, that's showing that, that, in fact, the augmentation, so the the... So one could say that the node contact homology knows, knows the unknot. So that one can prove directly using some kind of relation to fundamental group or actually grouping of fundamental group. And that's how, how we go about it in this paper that is in the makings, it's soon ready. Uh, but Lenny proved something maybe stronger. So he proved that, and it's not so hard to see from this string topological thing. So he proved that this uh, e to the 2 minus p times the a polynomial of the naught, which is a polynomial in e to the x and e to the p, divides uh, the augmentation polynomial at e to the x and e to the p to p and q is equal to 1. So, and the a polynomial by work of Kronheim Rovka, no, by work of other people using Kronheim Rovka, I don't know, it recognizes the unknot. So, there's a, somehow, if you're not unknotted, you have some interesting representation of fundamental group of the complement into SU2, which gives you some. So, a, a polynomial is something derived from SL2 representation of the knot, knot group. And uh, so, 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 in fact, this augmentation polynomial uh, strictly contains the A polynomial and the starting point from, um, uh, for tomorrow's talk is that from this, this augmentation polynomial therefore gives you kind of a deformation of the A polynomial. That was also found by other means from, from physics, and then the, the tomorrow's talk is to kind of relate it to and to talk about what's coming after this relation has been established. So I'll stop at this. So, so in higher dimensions, it's still true that the cusp locus has for dimension one and higher similarities than lower <coughs> dimensions. So, so like, what, why do you need restrictions on the singularities? No, you don't. The, the answer is that you don't, but it's, it's, uh, it requires proof. Because, you see, if you take a holomorphic curve, uh, then certainly you can say that the, it's bound, a rigid holomorphic curve, its boundary does not pass through any of these bad things. But now you're taking a rather bad limit, right? You, you're squeezing the Lagrangian or Lagrangian, if you wish, down to, towards the zero section where Basically, everything you like about holomorphic curve theory, like this uh, estimate between the internal metric and external metric, everything is blowing up in the wrong way. So, so one has to prove that also in the limit, 
you can preserve preserve this 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 property. So so it's it is true, but uh, we, we wrote something that we never really finished. But 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 it, it's a non-trivial statement because it's very hard to control this transality in the limit, right? So so what restrictions do you have? Do you need? So in the paper that I wrote, I basically do exactly these two type singularities. Uh, but, but in general, you can do it generally, and you don't have to know anything about these other singularities except that they have higher co-dimension. So, so it is, it is uh, a theorem in the writing, but, but, but it's, there is something to prove. You cannot just state that because they're rigid, they won't go there, because in, in the limit, you, you don't really have your favorite elliptic theory anymore. Yes? Uh, in polynomial is somehow SL2 story, so there is SLN element of a polynomial. Yeah. We have a similar story in your... Yeah, so, so in fact, uh, what turns out that uh, the, this uh, divide, but there are some additional factors here. So it's not, this is not equality, it's just divides. And these additional factors come actually from, from uh, other such representation like GLN. So, so, so this knows, uh, in some sense, about all these f flat connections on the not common. <laughs> that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. It knows about the ones with sort of. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. We, we, that looks like uh, that looks like you can use for. Yeah, right, right. right. So yeah, but, but you can take higher rank representations of this augmentation of this uh, algebra. You have to represent it somewhere else to get all. Of it. So I mean, if you always rank one representation of this algebra, you can take higher rank representations of this algebra. And that then, knows the other. And then you're saying that the Lagrangian of variety, which should replace the equal and longer yes. yes. Yeah. So that's right. And which would correspond to taking sort of parallel copies of this torus, right? So, so, so indeed. So, yeah. Okay, well, I think we should wrap up the discussion because it sounds very interesting, but it could obviously go on. So let's thank our speaker again.